Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I think you're in a whole variety of places, in fact, and I'll come to that in a second. But it, actually, it's, it's quite extraordinary that you're, you're here, really, even, even 26 of you, um, considering the time of year uh, and the topic at play today. The topic being, of course, Russian and Chinese activity in Antarctica and its implications. I, I suppose not necessarily the most obvious one uh, at any time, um, especially when there's a war uh, going on for Ukraine's very existence right now, thousands of miles away from the, the geography we're discussing today. Um, but if nothing else, I think social scientists and, and think tanks really ought to be looking at the, the not immediately obvious. Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, where the TV cameras aren't and reminding us, I suppose, that, that nature abhors a vacuum or uh, certainly certainly that Russia and China abhor a vacuum anyway. Um, <clears throat> and credit, I think, for the... Uh, prescient identification of this non-obvious topic goes to two people in particular. Um, first is Elizabeth Buchanan. I don't know if Elizabeth is out there um, in Canberra. I think Elizabeth is the, the I think, director of the Sea Power Centre Australia, a research institute inside the Australian Navy. And Liz has provided the impetus, the drive, uh, and crucially the funding for this research um, that we're discussing today. So Elizabeth, uh, God knows what time it is for you out there, but, but thank you very much indeed. Um, second person to thank you is my colleague Mathieu Boulet, who you can see on the screen. Uh, Mathieu, for, for reasons I don't fully understand, I identified polar politics as a key area of concern at, at least four or five years ago, when I almost pretty much after I started working with him. And his dutifully and, and bountifully conducted research on uh, Russian activity principally there uh, ever since. Qu quite extraordinary, really, <laughs> I really must say. Um, uh, and re most, most, most recently, and, and not least, the paper by Mathieu that we're discussing today, which goes by the same title as this seminar. Um, <clears throat> And it is published by Liz's Sea Power Centre Australia. And the link should be in your chat now. I don't think Matthew needs much more of an introduction than that, but he has made a move to the US recently, I must say, where he remains very much a part of us at Chatham House. Um, so also, Matthew, a fairly horrible time for you, I guess. How on earth did we get you all to, to agree to this um, to this timing? I, I, I do not know. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Matthew will, uh, in his initial remarks, look at the activity of these powers in the far south and its implications. But I'm also very pleased um, that we have Claire Christian joining us today. Uh, Claire is Executive Director of ASOC, that is the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, which works for protection and conservation of this continent and its surrounding area. Um, Claire is a true expert <clears throat> on one of these least understood places on the planet, I suppose, having been at ASOC since 2009, and we'll be looking at the future of Antarctic governance. So that Basically is it, ladies and gents, 10 minutes from Mathieu on Russia and China's activity in the Arctic and its implications, that's effectively the conclusion to Mathieu's paper, you see, and 10 from Claire as well on, um, on the future of Antarctic governance, as I say, and that leaves us about 40, 40 minutes for questions and answers in discussion if you type them into a chat. I don't think you can speak orally, so you'll have to, I'm afraid, leave me, trust me to read them out on your behalf. Um, we're on the record, um, I hope that's okay, I hope that's clear, so Mathieu, thank you again and over to you. Thanks a lot, James, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So I think the timing was to accommodate for the Australian time zone as well, so hence the, uh, hence the Zoom across the world. Um, so by way of introduction, I actually start with the conclusion of the paper, which is basically came to be in, as a consequence of the of Russia's second invasion of Ukraine, or Russia's war against Ukraine, in the sense that even the Antarctic, as if as in Antarctica and the, the Southern Ocean, are no longer insulated for geopolitical tension. So the sort of spillover of, of geopolitical issues, the spillover of mistrust in the international community that we have now with Russia, this major player in, in sort of 360 world affairs, is affecting uh, Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So in a way that the same pattern that we have in the Arctic as a place of low tension, an exceptional place based on good governance is also being affected in the Southern Pole by this, uh, this, this, this unraveling of ge the geopolitical world as it is. Um, I also want to um, give the spoiler that what well, you can read in the press concerning the fact that the Antarctic is going to crumble, the, the Antarctic treaty system is going to crumble, that it's going to be the end of Antarctic governance. All of this is not real. This There is a very solid body of governance, Claire will, I think, uh, remind us of that, uh, that it is not about to be the end or the, the harbinger of the end of the ATS, the Antarctic treaty system, as it is just because there is an odd player, and now with China, a second odd player, uh, trying to um, trying to gnaw at the different norms and to do away with the system. 
What we have on the contrary, I think is also needed to have a cool head on the fact that yes, Beijing and Moscow together and individually are definitely challenges, if not threats to regional stability, and therefore require a sort of catch up assessment or at least more effort on their activities from the Five Eyes community, the Five Eyes intelligence community, but also from all actors interested in operating in the region for good reasons, not to exploit, but to protect. And I think that's also the key, uh, the key word here. Um, so taken individually and together, Moscow and Beijing's actions and postures in the way that they are approaching Antarctic governance are definitely reshuffling the cards of good governance and the consensus-based uh, decision in the ATS. Yet, I think we should not overblow the threat as well that it do represent for stability in the region. There are activities they engage in which are damaging. There are things they are doing that we will explore together during this event. They are doing that is, of course, damaging, but this is not, once again, the end of everything as we know it. Um, nor will they be a sort of free-for-all um, everybody wants to claim post-2048 when the, the Madrid Protocol uh, come, is open to ratification, potential uh, renegotiation, sorry. One key area that I explored in this paper that is of particular interest to me is the use of dual use, dual purpose technology, mainly the sort of civilian military fusion that uh, Russia and, uh, and, and China are using in the, uh, in the region. This is also something and the use of dual use technology, whether it is um, space assets, whether it is re remote sensing relays and so on, is used and overused by all actors present in the region. This is equally true for France, this is equally true for the UK, for Australia, for New Zealand. The problem with Russia and China is the intention that they may have to use these systems for dual purpose, as in mostly military intelligence. So it is not about, once again, a full militarization of the continent, right? It's not like Russia and China are going to be placing little green or blue people on the ground in the next couple of months, but it really is about these actors trying to um, bend the norms or bend the rules of what is considered peaceful purpose as defined by the Antarctic Treaty System. And this because the treaty was made in such a way that it leaves a lot of room for interpretation, that it was written as a body of, of work in the 1950s and 60s that is not adapted to the technology of the 2020s, specifically when it comes to um, missile tracking systems, when it comes to command and control systems, to C4ISR abilities, when it comes to the, the ground-based space stations for remote sensing activities, all these things did not basically exist the way they do in the 1960s and 50s and are not adapted to reality. Not least also because the data collected by weather stations, for instance, by atmospheric research for terrain mapping and so on, could also be used for military intelligence gathering, for remote sensing, for uh, different kind of activities. Also, in the, the link with space is very interesting when it comes to radio and infrared telescopes, for instance, that can be used for, uh, for more military or harder activities. Um, there's also the risk that Russia and China would be interested in placing electromagnetic warfare assets or even anti-satellite capabilities. It's a remote possibility, but would be definitely a very strong signal that they are, their intentions are up to no good. Right now, we still have that sort of benefit of the doubt that dual-use technology is not used um, as, as such for, for peaceful purpose, but it is a doubt, right? It doesn't mean that we have called them red-handed uh, doing, uh, doing all these things. There, there is a particular concern uh, regarding China with the proposed uh, creation of an Antarctic specially managed area on Dome A in the Antarctic uh, area of, uh, of the continent, in the Australian, sorry, uh, part of the, uh, of the, of the continent, uh, to basically further ground-based space observation. The problem is that China is extremely pushy when it comes to uh, creating this asthma and could potentially um, block completely access to other players inside this, or deny access of other players to this, uh, to this area, not least because it is the highest point on the continent and could be very beneficial for ground-based uh, space operations. Uh, so all of this uh, is definitely to, something to keep tabs on. When it comes to the way Russia and China um, discuss or disrupt more 
uh, the, the the treaty and the, uh, the 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 body of governance and rules at their advantage. It's interesting to see, and this was part of conversations I was having with uh, with Claire actually. Is that I think it was your term, Claire, very much that there's a form of tag teaming between Russian and Chinese activities in the way they approach governance. It's not that they want to block or obstruct decisions. Uh, because they have an ambition to achieve anything. Sometimes there is also the willingness to obstruct just for the sake of it, to create and prepare better options for the future. So contestation becomes a game in a way, and the, the sort of constant obstructionism that we have in the track record of Russian and Chinese activities, whether it is at the Kamala, whether it is uh, during the, uh, the Antarctic uh, Treaty consultative meetings, shows that both countries basically come prepared probably discuss in the margins their course of action and, and to try to raise a form of guerrilla warfare to better disrupt or better, uh, better challenge the established norms. So it's quite interesting to see it uh, when it comes to their own interpretation of rational use or peaceful exploitation. The Antarctic has always been a sort of balance between exploit and, uh, and protect. Russia is, and China are definitely trying to bend the rules around what exploration or exploitation look like. Also, the way they've been vetoing a sort of attack teaming vetoing of the marine protected areas at Kamala. The way that they are both trying to undermine scientific work. Uh, and this was uh, also uh, work done, for instance, by my uh, our colleague Evan Bloom. And uh, at the Wilson Center, the Polar Institute, showing that there, there is also this uh, ability of Russia and China to use scientific data to create what we call scientific uncertainty, basically saying when there is not enough scientific data, well, there is not enough, so we can't make a decision. And when there is too much data, then your data is wrong or it's incomplete, then we can't really make a decision. Um, so it is or, or trying basically to deny the ability of science to prove things uh, and to, to get their way in that regard. So quite interesting to see the way they do it in energy exploration, uh, mineral resources, and fishing as well. Uh, and also trying to limit um, to, to limit uh, advances in protection of the environment, basically, whether for endangered species or also for uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, the environment in general under the impact of climate change. So quite interesting to see uh, in general that Moscow has no problem spoiling or trying to spoil the system by denying con uh, consistently or the, the, the very structure of governance, while Beijing tries to contest by eroding the trust in the consensus-based system. Uh, all of this is, of course, eroding the trust for everybody on board, even creating some problems between sovereign states uh, like the UK and Argentina recently, um, over fishing quotas, for instance, uh, trying to basically replicate what they do elsewhere in the body of work of the Antarctic Treaty System. So it is not Antarctica specific. It has nothing to do with the region in general. This is very much, at least for Russia, as I can understand, I'm not a China expert, but at least as the Russia part is concerned, this is a classic track record of Russian activities to subdue, subvert, contest, and spoil. Nothing new in this regard. The fact that it's actively coming to to the Antarctic is, of course, problematic, which means that we sort of need to catch up to that, right? And this is one of the main um, assessment of this paper for the Five Wives community, for the intelligence community and military communities of uh, the countries highly interested in keeping this uh, region stable and secure. There is a need for greater intelligence gathering and sharing. There is a need for better and more streamlined processes on how to approach the future of this dual use technology. Maybe we need to rethink, and that's one of the main uh, main recommendations of this, of this paper, is maybe we need to rethink and adapt our understanding of what dual use technology is. Basically, once again, because all of this is nice, but comes back from the 50s and is not adapted to what technology has evolved into and what we can do covertly with technology to promote potential dual use and, and dual purpose that goes way beyond uh, peaceful um, peaceful intent uh, in the region as defined by the uh, the Antarctic Treaty System. Um, so definitely some things to, uh, to keep tabs on um, and definitely something that we need to, to rethink collectively to make sure that we are not, com we're not completely um, sort of overtaken um, as we are slowly getting into the Arctic with this wake up call that we have now that uh, things have gone way too far in terms of the potential for miscalculation 
for tactical errors and also for uh, issues of governance in the future. So if, if, if the Arctic is definitely a harbinger for what happens in Antarctica, then the wake up call is now, right? It's not in 10 years, it's not 10 years ago, it really is now when it comes to making sure that the rules and norms that have been upheld since basically the 50s are adapted to modern reality uh, when it comes to a safe, stable uh, and protected uh, Antarctic. And I'll stop there and I'll leave the floor to, uh, to Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mathieu. Yeah, and I will go straight to Claire. I won't. I won't. I do have questions, but I, I won't get them right now. But I must say um, that your conclusions and your research on this paper, um, which is in the chat, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, are, are very familiar. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's don't panic, um, don't overreact, but at the same time, for Christ's sake, don't ignore. Um, because this, this is, uh, uh, you do that at, at, at your peril. So uh, thank you for that. That's very clear indeed. I'll come back to you, Mathieu, but actually I'd love to go straight to Claire now to talk about governance issues. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, just to sort of maybe explain to those in the audience who are not familiar with uh, the Antarctic Treaty System, um, my organization's role is that we are uh, the environmental civil society observer in the Antarctic Treaty System, which means we can attend governance meetings and make um, proposals uh, where we can present what we believe is as global environmental civil society, uh, what we believe the Antarctic Treaty System should do in terms of environmental protection, but obviously we can't participate in decision-making because we can't sign a treaty. Um, so we do have a, a front row seat um, to the all these goings on, um, and we have been involved um, in these discussions uh, since 1978, but we it took us a while to get an official observer status. We used to have to stand outside the meeting room. Um, <laughs> uh, not me personally, but my, my predecessors. Um, so just, I think it might be useful to, to briefly talk a little bit about the history of, of the treaty system. You know, when it was signed in 1959 um, with Russia as one of the original signatories, China was not an original signatory. Um, that was, you know, mainly an attempt to prevent Antarctica from becoming a place of, of conflict. Uh, it was, there was some mention of, of environmental protection, um, but it wasn't the main focus. Uh, over the years, as the parties started to discuss a possible um, addendum to the Antarctic Treaty that would have allowed mining, um, there was more focus on the environmental protection, um, partly because civil society heard about these uh basically closed door negotiations between the treaty parties and decided to um, get involved because they thought it was not a great idea that a handful of countries were, you know, carving up a continent without really any uh, input from anybody else. Um, and the result of that, of course, was that there was no mining convention and that inst instead there was an environment environmental protocol signed, uh, which banned mining, which was a, a pretty huge uh, turnaround, I think. And um, it kind of demonstrates that the Antarctic Treaty had evolved a lot in the decades since um, since it was signed in 1959. And, and to, to now, today, it's much more, um, the main focus of the Antarctic Treaty consultative meeting is on environmental protection, um, which I think is, is pretty impressive, actually, um, because you've got all these countries coming together, primarily talking about cooperatively protecting the Antarctic environment, not talking about who's going to drill for oil where. Um, and that's a that's a pretty big achievement. And, you know, at the time that the protocol was signed um, in 1991, many of these countries were initially reluctant to do that. Um, I have archives in my organization's files that's where the U.S. was saying that they would never sign such a thing and that allowing mining on the Antarctic continent was not negotiable. Uh, they used that phrase. Uh, obviously, it was negotiable because they ended up doing it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, for many of the countries in the Antarctic Treaty System, there's been a real revolution in values uh, over the past, over the history of the, the treaty. And um, that's, I think that's very powerful, actually, because as we're looking globally at challenges like biodiversity protection and responding to climate change, you know, I think in many respects, this is, a, it is an example of how, you know, yes, um, if there is political will, countries can make kind of difficult decisions that are in a long term, in, their, in the long term interests of everyone rather than in their own short term national interests. Um, and, you know, along the way, there's also another treaty, uh, the Convention on the, for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources that was signed. Um, and uh, that was also a very important, um, you know, evolution in, in the thinking of, of the countries involved in Antarctica, because when that treaty was signed in 1982, 
it contained, uh, you know, ecosystem as a whole protection principles and, you know, many elements of precaution. And it is primarily about conservation, uh, not, it's not just a fishing agreement. Um, so I, I would say that overall, uh, the Antarctic Treaty System over time has has become a very um, conservation focused entity. Um, and even though there are these concerns about, you know, territorial claims and national security, uh, there is a very, I think, genuine um, concern on the part of many uh, countries that participate in the system that they, um, you know, want to honor their responsibility um, in the treaty to protect the Antarctic environment and ecosystems. And I think that's really, that's really positive. Um, so China was a bit of a, a later comer to all of this. Um, they, you know, joined the Antarctic uh, Treaty in the 1980s um, and joined Camelar um, in, you know, 2006. Um, so they have not had the long history that Russia has had in the treaty system. Uh, but in recent years, um, you know, after they had been around for a while and had participated in meetings for a while, they, they in recent years, they have started to become um, more vocal in meetings, they've put forward more papers, um, and, you know, putting forward a paper at these meetings is how you basically propose a new policy, uh, if you're a country, so, um, so they have become more and more vocal, um, whether it's on, um, you know, some of the climate change issues or marine protected areas, um, they are speaking a lot more than, than they used to, um, and so, in terms of the main issues that both um, that these bodies are addressing, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, climate change is a big one. Um, we talked about the marine protected areas earlier. That is a major initiative of Camelar, and I think um, one that kind of demonstrates um, in how Camelar is a leading organization in conservation. Um, because in 2009, they committed to creating a, a system of marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. Um, which you know predated a lot of the the commitments we've seen in the past few years from countries to protect 30 30 percent of the ocean by 2030 some of these these other commitments um so that was really great um unfortunately since then they have not been able to honor that commitment um, because of the consensus requirement um and because proposals that uh, other countries have put forward have not uh, gained that consensus uh, you due to a very small minority. Um, right now, um, a couple of the MPA proposals in the East Antarctic and the Weddell Sea um, have 20 co-sponsors. Um, so that is the majority of Camelar. Uh, Camelar is 26 members in the EU. Um, and of those of the, the countries that are not co-sponsors, most of them are not outright opponents, but um, they still have some possible small issues to work out uh, before full adoption. Um, so I think that's actually, um, kind of very important, um, that, that we have these 20 countries on board. We have, uh, Korea on board, those two proposals. And when I started attending Camelar 10 years ago, Korea was in trouble because their fishing vessels were constantly violating, uh, Camelar rules. And, um, since then, uh, Korea as a government uh, has worked very hard um, to get into compliance with rules. They've become much more active at Camelar meetings. They are actually now proposing more, um, you know, more compliance related rules to make sure that, that everybody who's fishing in the Southern Ocean is complying. So that is a, a great example of the fact of how the system can work. Um, you have a country over the course of a decade that goes from breaking all the rules to helping enforce the rules. And um, Korea is also contributing to science in um, the Rossi MPA um, and uh, doing all other kinds of, of positive things, um, such as even chairing, they, the Korea chaired the compliance committee at Camelar that reviews fishing vessel compliance every year. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the, the system is still strong. Um, I think one thing that's important to, to maybe emphasize about both of these uh, agreements is that in many ways uh, they have all the tools that are needed to address modern challenges even though climate change was not envisioned when the you know that the, the threat of climate change and how much of a threat it is to the Antarctic environment was not really appreciated when any of these things were signed um, they have the tools you need to protect uh, species they have they give these countries all the authority they need to respond to climate change to protect biodiversity 
Um, and so that's, that's very positive. Um, but unfortunately, because of consensus, um, most of these things are not able to go forward right now. And uh, I think that really is a danger to the system um, because they have the ability to do these things. It's not as if there's, they would need to sign a new agreement uh, to designate MPAs or set aside areas that are uh, threatened by climate change or manage tourism, uh, which is another, another issue um, that the ATCM deals with. Um, but they are just not able to uh, get consensus on them. And so whereas they were once ahead of the curve, I think they're increasingly falling behind um, because they cannot make decisions. And that is coming at a time that is uh, very dangerous for the Antarctic environment. Um, so, you know, obviously Antarctica is a big place. Things are not happening uniformly everywhere. Uh, but in the Antarctic Peninsula, that's one of the fastest warming areas on the planet. It's about three degrees Celsius over the past 50 years on average. Um, and that is also where there's a ton of scientific uh, infrastructure. Uh, most of the tourism happens there. And that's also the site of a growing fishery for Antarctic krill. Um, so there's this, this area that is already under threat. We are already seeing the impacts of that. Some penguin species are already declining there. Um, and you're increasing the human activity, which increases the, the stress on the Antarctic environment. And um, in fact, the, one of the reasons Camelar was signed was because of, of um, fishing that had collapsed, Soviet fishing that had collapsed some fin fish fisheries in the Antarctic Peninsula area. And there was concern that if they started fishing for krill, which is uh, the base of the Antarctic food web, more or less, uh, that those problems would be just magnified uh, much more greatly because it would affect so many more species. Um, so now we are really, testing, I think, the limits of Camelar, because if, if Camelar is unable to successfully um, manage this, this growing krill fishery in this highly sensitive area, there will be problems. Um, and now there, something that people will often say is the krill is one of the most abundant animals on the planet, probably uh, all in all weighs more than the entire biomass of humans. But again, we're in, um, we're talking about a very concentrated amount of fishing in an area that's already under stress. So we're we're not talking about overfishing krill, but we're talking about making sure that we protect uh, these sensitive ecosystems in a small area because it is very possible for industrial ships to go in and deplete an area of krill and then there's nothing left for the wildlife or not enough left for the wildlife. Um, and that is, I, I will have to, I would have to say though that, that Camilla right now um, is having more success on krill. Uh, so that is kind of the one uh, bright spot. I, I would say. Um, Camelar a couple of, of years ago agreed to a scientific plan um, to discuss how to better manage the krill fishery and, and change the management somewhat because it's been static for more or less static for a number of years. And um, China is participating in that very um, constructively and they are committing the science to that because they do want to expand their krill fishing fleet and um, they do want to continue fishing in that area. So there is, um, there is still cooperation, even if there has not been very much progress on marine protected areas or uh, other climate change related issues in Camelar. Uh, there has been progress on krill and I think there will continue to be progress on that. Um, so I think that's a good uh, demonstration maybe of how uh, even when countries within the Antarctic Treaty System are very, um, you know, are having issues uh, with each other and are not able to agree on much, there are usually still areas where cooperation can occur. And um, I think the challenge for the system is for, for those countries that are proposing major environmental initiatives um, like the MPAs that, you know, they need to stay strong on those. Um, these are important issues. They're not going away and, and the science is on their side. They need to stay strong on that, but they also need to recognize that there are some areas where there is potential and, and science science is the foundation of the Antarctic Treaty. Science cooperation during the international geophysical year was what made people say, okay, we can we can do this. We can we can set aside these Cold War rivalries and, and do something here. Um, so I think that's really the challenge is to be aware of, of all the, the different tensions that are going on and they're not going to go away. 
um, but to look for those opportunities to cooperate and maybe build more trust. Um, and I, I don't mean to sound overly optimistic. I know that things are very difficult right now, but things were also difficult during the Cold War. Um, so I think we have we can't lose sight of that and the fact that this system has been stable for a long time, despite many sharp disagreements um, and many times. Um, so I think um, I think we we really we can't really from an environmentalist perspective we can't afford not to work together um, on protecting the planet. Um, so I think it really is worth um, worth the investment and worth the time, um, even if even if it seems that there are very sharp disagreements over the interpretations of these things. And and it is very clear that that there ha there is. Um, there are a small minority of countries within Camelar that are and, and the Antarctic Treaty System that are trying to say um, we have to balance certain things, we have to um, make conservation secondary to exploitation, um, and it's it's very clear. Um, and in fact, uh, one year at Camelar, China, I'm not China, um, Australia, and the U.S. put forward a paper saying this is how the convention has been interpreted in 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 throughout its existence and it has never been interpreted to say that conservation and use are equal it's always conservation first and you can you know have some fishing if it meets conservation principles so um i think it's really important uh for those countries to reinforce that um and to to continue you know promoting those values that have kept um these this the system effective for so long um but i think um you know there are there is, like I said, there is opportunity um, to work on science, to work on things. Um, science, science is uh, a great, uh, a great way to to build some of that trust. But I also think leaders at the top need to be focusing on this as well. Um, this isn't a problem that that can be solved at the Camelar or Antarctic uh, Treaty Consultative Meeting level. And um, you know, if if countries are committed to preserving the Antarctic environment, then they need to make this a national priority. So stop there. Claire, thank you very much indeed. And that, that's a, a great way to finish. And I, I might put that last point to Mathieu in a second. But um, I do notice that your two presentations actually were very complementary in your conclusions in the sense that you're both saying that there's a, there's a strong system here, um, but it's in danger. Um, and I thought that that came across very strongly from your different from your different disciplines, and your different your different backgrounds, if, if, if you like. Um, wow. Okay, this is absolutely fascinating. I, I can't. I, it's, it's wonderful. And I must just mention, ladies and gentlemen, the, the beautiful anemone behind Claire Christian there, photographed in the Southern Ocean. She said she wanted to raise awareness of it. Um, I just thought I'd mention that. But um, we've only got half an hour, even less, really. But if you don't have a hard stop, Claire and Matthew, then I might go on for five minutes if 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 we need to. Anyway, I've certainly got lots of questions. I think at least one or two have come up. Um, but I'm going to start off myself, if I might, and um, with, with a few things. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, could I, this makes, this may sound a very ignorant question, Mathieu and Claire, but I, I wonder, especially Mathieu, but maybe Claire as well, but Mathieu, on the basis of your previous research, uh, how much should we think about the, the two poles as, as different? I mean, obviously they're different as their poles, but uh, what I mean is, is whatever, you've done a lot of work on, uh, you know, high tension in, 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 in the high north, uh, Mathieu, and you're sort of extrapolating that and using it in the south. And I just wondered, obviously, the, the basic difference, obviously, I mean, you know, you can't you can't mine in the North Pole in the same extent. One's a, one's a land mass, one's, a, one's not. Russia and China are obviously much further away from uh, uh, from Antarctica. But can you tell me a little bit, are you are you trying to recommend that we think about the poles in similar ways? Or should we we have a very set, I mean, does, does a polar policy make sense? Or do you have to have a do you, do you have to sort of separate the two poles? <laughs> Something sounds silly. Uh, separate the two poles out, and I don't know if Claire wants to come in on that uh, 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 as well. That, that's one thing. Um, uh, can you, if you can mark that down, hopefully, and 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 come to it. Then I I also wanted to ask you. Um, well, Matthew in particular, I, I can't I can't avoid asking you this point, of course, because I know you follow the war in Ukraine, and obviously I have to. Uh, you, you'll you'll be expecting me to ask you this. Mathieu, but but look, Russia is obviously depleted right now. It's ha it's it has capacity issues. So I do wonder if if what your thoughts on Russia's ability to keep pushing its um, its agenda in the Antarctic, bearing in mind it is it is really going all out in Ukraine right now, and if you feel that that has a, will have an effect on its Antarctic policy, if you like, um, and and then finally, and I, I see, and I, it's the same question as I see that. Um, let me see, Abby Tingstad had, but I had the same one actually, but uh, it, which is. 
the differences between Russia and China, not between the two poles this time, but between Russia and China, um, whereby, you know, are we, are, we, are we lumping them together in a way here which we shouldn't? Um, do they have different uh, uh, agendas, different ultimate goals? Um, and and should we should we separate those two out as well and not and not put them together and perhaps your reasoning your 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 intellectual rationale for putting these two powers um, together in 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 this research I've I've kind of got more but I really also leave, I think I have to leave it there and maybe Mathieu if you want to if you want to go there and, and and Claire chip in afterwards perhaps but Mathieu sure absolutely thanks a lot James um, and thanks Abby as well for your for your question I know it's quite early for you so <laughs> thanks for sticking <laughs> for sticking by. Um, so listen, it's it's interesting. Uh, I think in terms of the two poles together. I mean, it was part of my previous research on the Arctic, on on Russia's sort of polar polar strategy or polar politics. Um, it, it it's not necessarily thought through by you know countries like Russia in in polar terms that they need to address both poles together. Very few countries actually have that sort of projection. Maybe China does in terms of the way they do approach. Uh, they do approach both poles consistently. Um, countries, you know, um, like Norway would, for instance, in terms of having a sort of polar approach as well for their interest in both in both uh, regions. But when it comes, you know, when it comes to the more nefarious activities or suspected nefarious activities, generally Russia and China come to the fore uh, because of their ability to operate there in the region and be present. Um, and, and further to to um, to Abby's question of sort of lumping them together, I don't think we should, and I completely agree in the sense that uh, Russia and China have two different ways of understanding what the poles should be and ought to be, two different ways of interpreting the norms and the rules, one to spoil, the other one to disrupt and to reinterpret at their advantage for China. Um, and over time, the long-term trend is not necessarily in the favor of greater cooperation. And I think this is also something that we should be looking into, uh, not necessarily to exploit it to our advantage, as was discussed back in the day in, in, in mainly in US foreign policy, but to try to understand how what are the cracks and the fault lines of cooperation between Russia and China when it comes to all issues. And all issues also need to be addressed when it comes to the Arctic and Antarctica. It's not just about world affairs, it's also about the poles. So lumping them together is definitely not a good thing. I think we should definitely separate their objectives, their posture, their capabilities as well. I mean, God knows that Russia is a very strong ground and territorial player in the region. Um, and when there is a sort of overlap of interest, I think you can look at it from the perspective that Russia controls, believes it controls the Arctic, and China's access to the Arctic must be on Russia's terms when it comes to passage through the Bering Strait, for instance, or the Chuhi Sea uh, for, for Chinese surface assets, for instance, or overflights with Russia close to the Russian airspace, or through the Northern Sea Route, it has to be with a Russian stamp on it to go through, basically. So ships are only allowed because Russia wants it. While in, in the Antarctic, I think we can look at it from the other way around when you can lump them together in the sense that China is highly interested in future exploration of the continent when it comes to uh, mineral resources, fishing, of course, as we already see it, and less so about protecting it. Uh, at least that's the trend that we're seeing. Um, while Russia, of course, has had some capabilities degraded, as you mentioned, James, has probably less time to spend on the Antarctic in terms of governance right now because of the war, and, and the war is not going anywhere. So it will be interesting to see how Russia catches up uh, to that or become more voiceful in the future when it comes to uh, consultative meetings or the Kamala. Um, but it might be in the future if you extrapolate it by the time uh, we can actually start discussions around exploitation and exploration um, it might be on China's terms and no longer just on Russia's terms. So in a way, Russia will follow where China goes, while in the Arctic, Russia leads the way and China has to follow whether they like it or not, because it is the sort of gatekeeper to, to the Arctic, at least on this side of the world. When it comes to the high north, it's also the gatekeeper, but geography is what it is. China is, a, is, not, is not a seaboard, uh, a seaboard player in the European high north. 
so I, th I think that's the way to see it. And, and all of this, of course, depends on the impact of climate change, depends on the state of the world. We are talking 50, 70, 100 years from now when we actually have waterways accessible through the central Arctic Ocean, where we have such a cataclysmic impact on the, the melting of the, uh, of the ice cap down south to actually be able to completely rethink geography when it comes to access to the continent in, in, in Antarctica. So the other argument I could use is that by the time we are you know, in 100 years where we have a complete cataclysmic uh, impact of climate change, um, you know, transiting through the Central Arctic Ocean would be the least of human concerns. Uh, or, you know, ex potentially exploiting mineral resources in, in the Antarctic will be the least of our concerns because we will have to face with the cold hard facts of the impact of climate change on daily livelihoods, on populations who will have to leave uh, physically their, their regions because they've been flooded or because they've been so impacted by, by climate emergency and so on, uh, and dealing with the consequences of droughts, of water, you know, and scarcity and so on that maybe all these issues will not matter anymore in a way, but that's almost science fiction. Uh, so to come back to what you were saying about, you know, the, 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 the two poles in the strategy, I think it's a sort of a wake up call for us as well. We, we don't necessarily have to have polar strategies in, in, our, in our Western countries. It's more about making sure we don't leave anyone behind and that we don't leave any weak signals behind just because we are too focused on compartmentalizing things and to making sure that we, we do address one issue without looking at the other. It's it's basically NATO's problem with flanks, right? The Eastern flank, the Nordic flank, the Southern flank, except the threats that we face do not think in terms of flanks. They don't think in terms of, you know, division of labor, compartmentalization of issues. So I, I think that's also sort of a wake up call that I had in this previous paper on Russia and this one on the Antarctic, that we need to think polar to make sure that we do analyze consistently the nature and, and the reality of the postures and the threats that potential contesters and contenders to these systems represent. And I think that's the mm -hmm. that's the main uh, that's the main thing. Claire, does and that make sense? To, oh, yeah. oh, sorry about you. I was yeah, going to finally know really quickly on, on yeah. Russian capabilities. And yeah, I think okay. you're right. Um, so very quickly on, on the Arctic, well, they are the ground forces have been decimated, yes, but the, all their aerial and surface capabilities and subsurface capabilities have been left un unchanged. So basically, they still have, you know, all the uh, all the air defense systems and all the, uh, the submarines and surface vessels they uh, they still had before the war, at least on the great majority of it. So it doesn't really change the equation in terms of posture. It's more a question of employment. Um, but definitely there is less appetite uh, probably moving forward when it comes to the Antarctic. Uh, it'll be less, it's never been really high on the agenda, let's be honest, <laughs> from a Russian point of view. It's never been, you know, at the forefront of manual control by Putin. Um, it'll be even less so now because of the consequences of the war. So there might be once again a catch up moment that Russia will have. Uh, to have. Thank you very much, Mathieu, for a very full answer. Claire, can I can I ask you your, you to comment on that as well? I mean, is it does it make sense, as Mathieu says, to to think polar and to to think of these two poles as <laughs> separate, which they obviously are, um, or or is there something specific to the Antarctic which you're primarily concerned in? I know, and and I, I see something from Tony Press. He says here the two poles are very different. Almost all the Arctic is subject to some form of uh, potential or national jurisdiction, national water disease, ADCS, whereas the Antarctic does not, while, while the Antarctic Treaty is in force. So I guess he's sort of well, saying the same. One is an ocean, the other one is yeah, territory. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. of course, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it is vastly different, but it doesn't mean that the policies and the issues affecting them are not. Sure. That's, Claire, that's Claire is that, is that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And especially from uh, an environmental uh, organization's perspective, uh, you know, we're, we're facing global environmental challenges and the international legal system we have is so fragmented. So as, as you said, compartmentalized, um, that it really does hold back progress, not just in the Antarctic, but in another, a number of areas. I mean, I personally see the way that some countries, um, act in the Antarctic Treaty System, you know, I think, oh, this country, I won't name names, but is great. They, they're proposing all these great things. And then I hear from colleagues at another forum that they're uh, actually trying to, you know, get away with as much as they possibly can. And I'm thinking, how can this possibly be? This country is so such a positive actor here. Why aren't they a positive actor everywhere? So even within countries, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, divided, divided opinions sometimes. Um, and so I do think that we should be thinking more polar. I mean, the the poles are, you know, major influencers on our global climate system on, you know, our in all kinds of, um, you know, the planet. Um, and so the idea that just because, you know, we have these 
artificially human created legal structures that are different so therefore we should think of them differently uh, for all time is I think um, you know increasingly outdated um, and I know it's very difficult to change these kinds of things once they're in place but um, I think to the extent that we can in envision a, a system where we're not um, where we're acting more consistently across the poles and thinking of them both in similar ways you know in terms of okay these areas are very important and we need to prevent them um, we need to, you know, we need to prevent climate change because they are important and we also need to prevent conflict over them. Um, okay, so we I should be doing important. that, Claire, but are we doing that? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. That's that's unfortunate. Um, I, I think there is, you know, there has been, I have seen some uh, small changes in mm -hmm. Antarctic Treaty parties thinking a little more globally, thinking about, um, you know, how, how, should, how should we be acting at, you know, the UNFCCC um you know the the climate cops uh because we have this responsibility to protect antarctica so shouldn't we be taking that to the climate cop there is some of that but unfortunately i don't think the change is happening as fast as the environmental changes are happening fair enough thanks very much indeed both of you Mathieu, can i turn back to you uh, there's a question from jane rumble very interesting i was going to ask it myself as well but your research here has uh, focused on, on on implications for the five eyes that's obviously two three northern hemisphere countries and, and two southern hemisphere countries and and just 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 why what's why five eyes and not other potential alliances other countries which surely have an interest in the antarctic could you just give us a little on that sure absolutely so five five eyes came to be in this paper more specifically so as, as a rejoinder of the intelligence communities of australia new zealand canada mm -hmm. the us and the uk for, yeah. for the audience um, not least because this, this is not a geopolitics paper, and we are not looking at political alliances and the future of military alliances. I'm really looking at the very reality of intelligence, basic intelligence gathering and intelligence uh, usage when it comes to daily activities of Russia and China and the ecosystem. So it came to be because not of extrapolating the, the trend, but really looking at the reality of what we see when it comes to Russian and Chinese activities in the region, and also because the angle that I, I had for this paper was based uh, on, on, on dual use technology and military potential militarization. And since militarization always starts in a way with intelligence gathering, um, then this is the very threat and the very problem that the Five Eyes are facing today. And also because it, it was, I was also looking at whether the Five Eyes is or are um, sort of ready for the challenge in a way uh, as of today when it comes to the wider implications of, of Russian and Chinese uh, potential nefarious activities in that sphere and uh, looking at this as sort of militarization as it is because it's a it's also as a consequence of the war people see militarization of issues everywhere right we see we see the and that's also what Russia's psychological warfare has been doing, is that we tend to see the militarization of everything just because Russia is present. Um, so I think it was also sort of a, an assessment on that, uh, a reassessment on, on, on that, and to try to be more, more realistic. Thank, thanks, thanks, Mathieu. Yeah, that, that makes sense, uh, and thanks for the clarification. Um, I'll move on, and uh, probably this one is actually for, for Claire. In fact, it's Austin Short's question. Um, Austin asks, what would be our weaknesses, as in the West's weaknesses, if you like, um, from a moral standpoint, when trying to encourage compliance um, and better behavior from, from Russia and China? Have we all, I mean, I can imagine your <laughs> answer, Claire, but have we always acted in the best interest of environment and cooperation? I'm sure your answer is gonna be no, or, or, or is, it, is it more about um, acts of exploitation? Uh, well, as I mentioned, um, many countries in the Antarctic Treaty System kind of only came around slowly to the idea that we should be banning mining instead of uh, instead of encouraging mining or at least allowing for mining. Um, so it has been an evolution, um, and you know, countries are not perfect. Um, before the Environment Protocol was put in place, um, many countries did you know damaging things. They, there's still contamination in some of the waters around scientific bases that you can detect because of decades ago pollution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think that all countries are perfect. Um, and I do think that, you know, many countries still, um, you know, have their territorial claims, even though these are effectively, um, you know, not on the table anymore because of the Antarctic Treaty there, nobody else has to recognize them. Um, many countries still have those in mind um, and they, you know, they still are are working um, to in their own national interests to a certain extent. Um, but I also think that that things like um, the proposals for marine protected areas show that there 
is a commitment to a, you know, a shared vision for Antarctica, that it's not all just about defending a claim or protecting, you know, your territory for the future. Um, and um, so I, I don't know. I mean, there are definitely examples of things. Not every country is perfect. I mean, for example, Australia was recently proposing to build a gigantic runway um, and that would have been probably the largest infrastructure project in Antarctica ever. Um, but fortunately, they changed their minds uh, and they decided not to build it. Uh, so there are definitely examples where people are making perhaps decisions that we as, as an environmental uh, community don't agree with. Uh, but largely, I think we're, we're very pleased that the countries are making proposals for ways to deal with climate change, for new protected areas, uh, for ways to more effectively regulate fishing to make sure that, that, that a growing fishing industry in the Antarctic does not threaten the ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that, um, that the challenge is to um, make, uh, you know, continue making the case to countries that are skeptical. Why do we need to do this? Um, why is this, um, you know, why are we doing, why, why are we doing this? Um, and I, I don't think, um, unfortunately, um that the, everybody agrees with those reasonings yet um but you know you can't give up I, I actually recently saw a paper um from a chinese researcher in a chinese uh polar institute publication where he was talking about opportunities for collaboration during the next international polar year which is a long way off but anyway still i think so there i think there is some willingness there um, thanks yeah yeah no thank you claire i, I think uh, continue making the case is a mantra which we all live by in in, in, our, in our respective jobs but so i i take that point and i'll come back to the the, the cooperation point at the very end because i think that's what you left with and that's what i'm going to going to end with but in the meantime but and also perhaps for you it's it's, it's good continuation i'm just going to read out it's a commentary you're having a question and you don't have to comment on it but jeffrey mcgee's comment is this uh with the Chinese proposal for an Antarctic specially managed area, ASMA, for the Kunlun Station, it's important to note it has not been on the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting agenda for the last two meetings, so it appears to have dropped away. Also, even if an ASMA was agreed by consensus, it wouldn't prevent other states from operating there. We just have to abide by the ASMA. And, I, and, and again, I suppose, I suppose that, that actually links onto what you were last saying there. Um, you don't have to comment on, on, on that at all, but uh, it's, um, I just thought it, it, was, it was an interesting an interesting point. Now we, we're coming towards the end, and, and I I don't have any more questions on screen, but I do have one myself, so that's that that's um, uh, that's fine. But um, uh, yeah, you you made the point, Claire, that uh, look, we always managed to do this in the Cold War, um, and that science is a great basis for cooperation, a great way to build trust. Were your exact words. Um, but you also conceded it's not looking good right now. You're obviously con <laughs> uh, conversant with and conscious of, of, the, of, of the situation uh, between Russia and almost everybody else, quite frankly, um, right now. So I, I suppose as a Russianist myself, I have some skepticism uh, of the possibilities that, that cooperation is a great way to build trust here, because, because uh, look, look at it this way, a, a colleague of mine once said that the only places, that, uh, this was years ago, he told me the only places in the West and Russia usually cooperated were in Nagorno-Karabakh and, in, and, in, and, and, and in, on the ISS, the International Space Station, and he said that the basic point was that you've got to go into outer space to do cooperation with Russia, and even that's not true anymore, um, bearing in mind here. So I, I'm, I'm something of a skeptic, bearing in mind the 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 horrific um, state of relations and and effectively war between Russia and and Western states that that there is, that there are many possibilities here. Plus, you know, Matthew was saying that some, in, to a certain extent, um, they were spoiling for spoilerings' sake. Um, so, uh, so let me switch it to Matthew then and say, Matthew, what do you, do you do you agree? Do you think that um, that the Antarctic is a basis for cooperation? If there is any possible Russia Western cooperation here, I'm specifically about Russia here. As you can see, um, or or is you know is it something that can be separated out from the wider fallout, or or is it going to be a victim of the wider fallout, Mathieu? It's it's a really good question, and you know I, I don't want to be deterministic about it, but I don't think it will <laughs> it will be a victim or the fallout of the war and or anything. I mean, we've seen during the the, the recent consultative meetings with Kamala, <laughs> some walkouts, diplomatic walkouts, for instance, and you know, the, the, there has been some consequences of the war, as it should, right, that Russia should not be allowed to get away with it anywhere, which it, it should be hunted for that in every nooks and crannies of the, you know, of, of the world of governance and norms. But yet again, the, the Antarctic Treaty system is not about to crumble just because Russia is behaving badly in other parts of the world. And I think 
there is, you know, there is this holistic understanding that it is not just about people, it's about the planet, it's about living creatures that are not just humans. So it's a it's a de-self-centered way of approaching governance, which is good. And as I think Claire mentioned uh, already, it's, it's really about the protection of non, you know, non, uh, non-human species uh, and the environment in general. So I think there is also this understanding that we can't we can't let the system crumble. We can't let this discussion stop just because man is waging war against man. And it's tragic, yes, of course. It you know, but it's not a testament of loss of life and and, and and civilian life specifically in Ukraine. But this is the reality. The world goes on, and the world must unfortunately deal with the consequences of Russia's actions. So now the question is, what do we do to make sure that they are made and felt responsible for it? without completely destroying the system or at least sawing the branch that we're sitting on uh, and an increasingly fragile branch as it is, right? I don't want to once again be a, a harbinger of the end, but we need to do something about the system we so love uh, to make sure it is still alive when the time comes that there is enough disruption to, to make it very shaky. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think the wider question will be for the Arctic, and if we link up the polls again, is that the, the consequences of Russia's war will be much more felt in the Arctic when it comes to cooperation there and all the discussions that are starting to emerge now with military security, the fact that Russia's vision of an all NATO Arctic has been vindicated by the expansion of Finland and Sweden to the uh, to the alliance. So it is feeding a lot of uh, increased posture for the Kremlin in the, in the coming years, probably. Um, for the Antarctic, I think, you know, the question is more about finding ways forward that tether back Russia into the reality of marine conservation, of protection of the environment, of, you know, better behavior and a better track record of behavior uh, in the region. So this will take time and effort. Uh, This will not be done or achieved in a day, but hopefully this will continue to to go on. The other advantage is that, well, sort of advantage is that since the Antarctic is slowly slipping out of the key priorities of the the Putin regime, then there's a chance that things will actually start to take place a bit more, not least because nobody's really looking um, at the uh, in the Kremlin. Um, I mean, the, the people they send to 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 Hobart for for discussions or for the, uh, the ATCMs uh, are generally technocrats who know their things extremely well. They're mini Lavrovs, James, for the joke. That they they know they know everything to the letter and to the coma in every document and you know in, in the hundreds and thousands of pages that they are. But they're not really decision makers. They're just enforcers of decisions that are made for them. The problem is that if no one is making really decisions because they're a status quo because of the war, then it means that you can actually push and shove around to make sure that at least things don't get degraded. They stay the same. And it's already sort of a victory uh, in many ways. Mathieu, thank you very much indeed. Your your work here is over. And I'm going to um, I'm going to come to Claire for the last thing. We, we heard from Mathieu um, his sort of final um, recommendation when he was presenting in his initial 10 minutes. And it was, um, I think if, if I understood Mathieu correctly, it was is really to, to um, Mathieu advice that we really need to rethink and adapt our understanding of dual use tech. Um, that's why I took from Mathieu anyway. So Claire, could I ask you, if, on the basis that the international community has limited capacity um, to think about these things, there's a lot going on. Um, what would be your single, rec- if, I, if you had to give one recommendation, if there's one thing the international community should must do, whether it's Five Eyes, another grouping, you know, in terms of um, Antarctic protection and ensuring that the system remains you know, pretty strong. Could I, could I just ask you for you, what's the one thing we must do? Uh, wow, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> um, I guess I would just say that um, countries that are supporting conservation, um, whatever whatever it is, um, I think they just need to continue. They I think they need to work together more closely. I think they need to coordinate more closely. I think they need to uh, get <clears throat> higher level folks in their countries involved, um, and I think they need to be more consistent across international organizations um, because these the views that are anti if to the extent that conservation is being blocked in the Antarctic Treaty system you know this is reflected at other uh, institutions as well at the UNFCCC at the CBD um, at the negotiations on the new high seas treaty uh, under UNCLOS Um, so I guess I would just say that if if you really think that environmental protection is is a priority you need it needs to come from the top down and it needs to be consistent and you need to have a clear message um, that comes out from all the supporters so that you're, it's very clear that you're all united um, all the time. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Claire um, and Mathieu. Obviously, um, we'll 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 that is the hour, and it's been a re an hour really really fruitfully well spent. And I can't imagine that I, I would imagine that everybody's taken a lot from this. Bearing in mind it's uh, bearing in mind the, the topic, um, I would just say in closing, honestly, thank you both, uh, Mathieu, for driving this project um, yourself um, and your 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 passion for polar politics, uh, and and Claire for your your passion. I suppose principally for the Antarctic, but but and and, and your. You know, you, but you're speaking, spoken not just from passion, but from a great deal of expertise and experience there. Um, very grateful indeed, and hopefully we will continue this. And we will also, I, tell, I said at the beginning, uh, this has been recorded, and I think we'll post this on our website if nobody minds, but we'll check. Um, so with that, and I also must thank one more time, um, Elizabeth Buchanan. I can't, don't know if you're out there, Elizabeth. Um, I can't see you on my screen in terms of the names on my screen, but perhaps you are, and, and your Sea Power Centre Australia, um, which provided the necessary impetus and funding for this project. So that really is it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, from Mathieu, Claire and her anemone. Um, thank you very much uh, and goodbye. All the very best. And Merry Christmas, by the way. <laughs>